Welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is author and athlete Brad Kearns discovering ways to be healthy, fit, and happy in hectic, high-stress modern life. So let's slow down and take a deep breath, take a cold plunge, and expertly balance that competitive intensity with an appreciation of the journey. That's the theme of the show. Here we go. The Get Over Yourself podcast is brought to you by Almost Heaven, beautiful compact home use sauna kits, ancestral supplements, grass-fed organ meats in a capsule, DNA Fit, genetic testing for custom diet and exercise recommendations, Integro Health, high-potency liquid probiotic called Flourish, Organifi, organic powdered superfoods, delicious green, gold, and red powders, Wild Eye Deer Buffalo, sustainable, grass-fed, beyond organic, real ketones, clean burning ketones for athletic performance and fat loss. And check out the bradkerns.com slash shop page. That's my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance. And here we go with the show. So age to me is, is not an excuse. It's not a reason to fail. But I hope it's a reason to motivate people. I hope it's a reason for other people to look and say, hey, the fact that I'm in my 40s or my 50s or my 60s, or for some people in their 30s and they're feeling old or whatever, the fact is you can still go out there and, and there's a lot you can achieve. So, you know, if I say like, hey, how do you steer turn six, right? And someone wants to screw around with me, and they say, well, it's going to feel like you want to steer down here, but you really need to take the higher line. So steer up at that point, right? And then and the next thing you know, my sled and I are in the roof, you know, with wood chips in my shoulder. So there's a whole other element, too. It's like, all right, if you're screwing with someone, you're not just helping them get a bad time or a lesser place. You're potentially putting someone's life in jeopardy in this sport if you do that. I want to run a four-minute mile. If I go out and run a 358, and Brad here runs a 350 and kicks my butt. I am not upset with how that race went down, okay? I had my standards, I put out as much as I could, and I had a huge success there in that, in that instance. Hey, how about a backwards commercial? Are you ready? So, go to OrganifiShop.com and enter the discount code BRAD for 20% off your order. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I Shop.com. Why would I do something as silly as a backwards commercial? It's because I'm positive you have to try this stuff. Trust me, order some now. It's going to change your life. Organifi is an organic superfood supplement company. They're known for their greens. You take them when you travel, get all your nutrition. But I like their top secret Organifi Gold Warm Relaxation Beverage. This is the single best tasting tea you will ever try in your life. So if you want something soothing, delicious, nutritious at the end of your busy, productive day, pour yourself a scoop of Organifi Gold. What's in there? Turmeric, the anti-inflammatory superstar is the base. And then, listen to this, smooth coconut milk, cinnamon, ginger, lemon balm, and two super mushrooms. It's legit. It's delicious. Check it all out at OrganifiShop.com. And don't forget to put in Brad for 20% off. Try Organifi Gold. If you're not totally satisfied, send it back to me and I'll keep it. Hi, it's Brad to introduce my conversation with Larry Sidney. Oh my gosh, this is a true story of a gentleman who literally came out of the crowd to pursue an Olympic dream at the advanced age of 44, 45, 46, who's counting, but he was on an Olympic spectator binge. He was captivated by his first live attendance of the games. He and his buddies went to the 2006 Winter Games in Torino, and then he went on this binge where he went to the Summer Games in Beijing in 08, and then the Winters in 2010, back to London in 2012, back to Sochi in 2014, and also became captivated by this 
death-defying event in the Winter Olympics known as the skeleton. You've seen these guys sliding headfirst down the icy course that you're familiar with from the bobsledding and the luge where they're lying backward. Yes, he decided to try for the Olympic Games in Skeleton after going with his brother, Big George, who we're going to hear all about at his own podcast. But his brother, this master of all things water and winter sports, took him over to uh, a training camp that they had for the public in Salt Lake City where there's a a skeleton bobsled luge track. So they paid their fees, uh, took a few classroom courses, I imagine, just like the race drivers do. And then that first fateful ride kicked off an amazing journey where he basically went for it, man. He did the real deal, went all in, Uh, arranged for an opportunity to compete for the great nation of Israel uh, for some precious few spots in the Olympic roster. And as we go through this conversation, I think a lot of reflection and insights will come up for you. I love this theme because you know that I'm pushing this idea of pursuing uh, competitive goals with high intensity throughout life, calibrating them and adjusting them for your age and for your lifestyle circumstances. But here was a guy who did not think he was too old. In fact, he turned that concept on its ear and decided that he was going to be an inspiration for older guys everywhere going for it and competing against those obsessed Olympians who dedicate their life at a young age and go all in. And wow, the the ending's uh, an interesting twist. There's a lot of fun stuff in the middle. I think you'll notice uh, that he gets very technical and precise as he describes the qualification process and the standards that you have to reach uh, to progress toward a precious Olympic spot. And it's interesting to note, if you're not interested in the skeleton and you might zone out over uh, the nitty gritty details, and this may not be of tremendous interest to you if you're not a skeleton fan or uh, a big time athlete with interest in the Olympic Games and how athletes qualify. But I think it's important to notice that his thought process reflects the importance of a methodical approach to pursuing goals, where you not only sweat in the gym and unleash your inner dragon beast when it's time for competition, but also that you know what the F you're doing and you pursue your goals with expert guidance, people helping you that have experience and are guiding you so that your energy output goes toward a good cause and is not wasted in the spirals of overtraining or misplaced competitive intensity where you're not harnessing those wonderful competitive instincts to put to good use and perform when it counts. Yes, we get into some interesting dilemmas like the importance of the athlete to be self-focused and self-directed and managing some of this give and take that occurs where you're trying to be sportsmanlike, but you're also competing against people for some scarce competitive opportunities, Olympic spots. You always have the politics when it comes to Olympic sports interesting and tough things to navigate and then take these lessons that you learned in that intense competitive environment and apply them to peak performance goals in all areas of life. And today, Larry is off the rails with his Olympic dream. He's off the course and on to the next phase of life. He's a new father settling in, podcast host, fantasy football podcast, and fun, interesting guy. Let's hear from him about his wild Olympic dream in the sport of skeleton. Larry Sidney. Thank you for sitting in this beautiful location. We're looking at Lake Tahoe, Nevada right now, your new home. You've had quite a journey. Uh, Most fascinating to me is pursuing this Olympic dream at the advanced age of what you're a 40-ish dude and (sighs) did this crazy, crazy skeleton thing. So I guess we should back up to... Um, you're, you're a longtime educator uh, out there on the East Coast, and then uh, some stuff changed in your, in your life path, and you started to get these crazy dreams formulating. So tell me, tell me where the starting point was, and we'll, uh, we'll get the, the listener pumped up for yeah. pursuing, pursuing your goals and dreams, even if they're crazy. Right. Yeah, Brad, thanks for having me on the, uh, on the podcast today. Um, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do justice to this, I'm gonna go back to, to 2006 on a whim. Two friends who lived in different parts of the country from me, um, we, the three of us decided to go to Torino, see the Olympics, and um, we just kind of winged it. We didn't have tickets, we didn't have hotel. All we had were 
flights. And all three of us were coming into different airports. We had flights and we had a rental car. Um, and this was kind of pre cell phone too, in terms of international travel. So we were just winging it and, um, just had the most amazing time blown away by what the Olympics were, the collaboration, people from all different countries cheering for each other's athletes and, um, just blown away by the whole experience. And again, repeated in 2008, went to Beijing, saw the Olympics. Oh, you got that little bump there, the two year when they, uh, yep. oh no, you went to Summer Olympics. Summer Olympics. Right. Summer when, Olympics. Yeah. yeah. yeah yep. In the 90s, they had the Winter Olympics switch. Right. And those, those fortunate athletes had a two year window. <laughs> they, they went, <laughs> yeah. you know, two years, four years. That was great. Oh, yeah. so was that the first Olympics you ever saw live? So Torino I saw live and then went to Beijing and then went to Vancouver and then went to London in 2012. And and Sochi in 2014. So, no way, so dude. I, I, that is that is gangster. Yeah. You're just like Olympic Olympic guy. Yeah, yeah. And and if you've never been to an Olympics, um, for someone who's a fan of sports or for someone who isn't, it's it's just an incredible experience. And so and so I caught the bug. And it, and it really wasn't at that point. It wasn't like, hey, I want to be an Olympian because it was, hey, I'm uh, you know by time by time London came in 2012. Uh, I, I just turned 40. And so I'm like, all right, I can't do this as an athlete, but I can, I can be part of it as a fan. Um, maybe I get to get to meet some athletes and, uh, throw my support around and, 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 you know, just enjoy what this really is. Um, and that time you're like meeting Bob Costas, like you again, (laughs) Hey, what's up, dude? You know, you, Bob Costas and your, did your, did your friends join you on this binge from 06 to 14? So no, no. So so just you, the last man standing, you and Bob Costas. Yeah. Bob and I, Bob and I actually, 2012 was, was a breakthrough because I actually, um, got to go into the USA house and met Carl Lewis and got to, got to talk for a couple minutes to Carl Lewis, who was, um, for someone who was, who was from my era growing up in the eighties and I was a no track and field athlete. And this, this was God. I mean, there's, you know, there's kind of no other way to say it. This is who this guy was. And then to get to meet him in person, um, just, just a huge treat, you know, just like, wow, this is, this just keeps getting better and better this Olympic thing. So in 2012, I was getting close to wrapping up my 15th year of teaching in Connecticut and um, got connected with the group out here in, in the Reno Tahoe area, the Reno Tahoe Winter Games Coalition, <laughs> who was angling to earn the right to host an Olympic Games for the United States. And the offer came to me, uh, hey, Larry, why don't you move out here? Why don't you come work with us and help us get a bid together so that we can host an Olympic Games here in 1960 Squaw Valley? For those who aren't from the area here, Squaw Valley is part of Lake Tahoe. That's part of this region. And so it would really be um, getting the Olympics back out here a second time. So I was thrilled and um, finished my last year teaching, moved out here three days after I got out here. And mind you, I drove cross country, you know, with the luggage rack on top of my car and all this. Did you have like the rings? Like, you know, when it says just married on the back window, you got your <laughs> Olympic rings. Like, I'm going for the gold, baby. I'm leaving my life behind. Oh, and I, I, are we going to guess where this, where this, the end of this sentence goes? The, two days after you yeah. got out here, so, what happened? Yeah, I get out here and, and the U.S. Olympic Committee puts out uh, a press release. Hey, um, for the next few years, we're only interested in pursuing summer Olympic bids. <laughs> So, um, again, you know, this is Lake Tahoe. This is not, I mean, don't get me wrong. We're sitting out here summer. We're on the lake. It's gorgeous here. There's nowhere you'd rather be, but this is not a community that's set up for a summer games. This is a community that is, that is clearly in the thick of the winter games chase. This is a, a ski haven. And, um, you know, that's what, that's what this is. That's what this is. Lake Tahoe is all about, um, you know, a place that could have a great Olympics. And so, so here I was, and I just got out here. And a couple of days later, all of a sudden, my job's gone. And my opportunity to be part of this group chasing Olympics um, to bring it here is gone. And so um, it, it, just, it just was a huge life change that happened. First, my choice to, to leave Connecticut and come out here and change my life once that I decided to do. And then a second time where I didn't really decide to do this, it kind of got thrown at me. It was a curveball and it got thrown at the whole group. And so, um, so it just put us on, in a hibernation mode in terms of chasing Olympics. There were other things we could do as a group, um, but in terms of the sponsorships, financials, 
um, job prospects, all those things, it was, it was basically being put on hold. So, um, so anyway, so I was out here in Tahoe, uh, my brother's out here and, and thought, let's, let's make the most of this. And so in the winter time, um, we talked about going into Park City, who, you know, Salt Lake City had hosted the Olympics in 2002, and Park City is where they had held the bobsled, the skeleton, and the luge events. So my brother, Ray, and I said, hey, um, we should go out there. They have these driving schools where someone who's never done it before can go. You can spend a week there, try it out, learn how to do it, kind of work your way up the track, and uh, have some fun out there. And so we decided, yeah, let's go for it. Heck, why not? So here I am, 40 years old, and Ray's a couple years older than me. And um, But the listeners should know you guys are extraordinarily uh, talented athletes. And uh, your brother Ray here in Tahoe is a big philanthropist and noted original gangster on all manner of water and snow sports doing these tricks on. If you look on my Instagram, his tricks on the uh, the wakeboard this morning were mind-blowing <laughs> and then out on the ski hill. So these guys are like, uh, they're fierce listeners. They, they they go crazy. They're fearless. And that I guess that's going to help when you go to, is it actually called like luge riding school or skeleton school? Uh, sliding school. Sliding school. Skeleton, let's call it Skeleton University. Skele- yeah, so skeleton, yeah, Skeleton U. You went to sliding school. We went to the U. Yeah. And um, and we went, and, and you know, it's a funny thing, too, because in the end of the story, we're going to talk about, about my attempt at making the Olympics uh, in the sport of skeleton. But at this particular time, we'd never done it before. It seemed pretty crazy to go down a sheet of ice head first. And um, I'm afraid of heights. So there was this whole other piece of it, like, gosh, what's what's it really going to be like? And is this something I want to do? So um, we got there and we started school. They gave us a little introduction. And uh, we're in Park City, the same place where they had the 2002 Winter Olympics. Um, Jim Shea from the U.S. was a gold medalist. So just a, an amazing place to be and the history there. And uh, my brother went down first. And so then it was my turn. And well, you guys chose the skeleton of all so the things. We chose the skeleton. So, um, listeners, you, you, you're probably familiar with the um, the guy sliding down the track in the big bobsleds, and on the same track they have the luge, which is the guy lying down on his back and pointing the toes and toning. And right. then the skeleton is that is that head first thing where they dive onto the sled and your arms are uh, behind you, right? Yeah, they're down at your side. That's crazy yeah. shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the one you chose. Yeah. Ray went first. Did you draw straws or did you just say the the, um, I, the older brother goes first? I don't know. You know, I don't even remember how it was decided. I think um, our, our skeleton coach was Lincoln. So he he competed in the in those same Olympics in, in Park City. And now he's he's the head skeleton coach in, in Park City. And um, he was just kind of we, we had, I don't know, we had about 10 of us maybe in the skeleton school in that particular class. And so he was just sending us, you know, hey, next guy, come here, get on your sled, let's get you positioned, and I'll give you a little push down the hill, and let's go. And um, and we were starting halfway down, halfway down, because um, it'd just be way too dangerous to put someone at the top who's never done it before. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> you've never done this before. Uh, it feels a little crazy. So so my brother had gone. He's down at the bottom. And now Lincoln's looking at me and he's, all right, Larry, uh, get on your sled. And so part of me is thinking, maybe, maybe I just want to watch my brother this week. But the bigger man in me realized that because my brother had already gone down, I kind of didn't have a choice. I had to go down and, um, and really I had to go down better than him, whatever the heck that even meant at the time. So, uh, so for that reason, I did it. I got to the bottom um, my throat was completely dry, completely dry, just, just parched. Um, but the ride was amazing. You know, the energy of it, the thrill of it. Um, and so at that moment I knew like, okay, I'm good for this week because, because this is going to be awesome. I'm just going to have so much fun. If you've ever bungee jumped, which I haven't cause I hate heights, but from what I know of bungee jumping, it's the kind of thing that if you do it, you might want to do it again because it's just a really cool energy rush. And this was that opportunity to just do it over and over and over. So um, so we finished school, skeleton school, the skeleton U. So you got quite a few runs? Got a bunch of runs, worked our way up the track. We got to the second highest start. So we did not get to go off the top. Um, we went off what's called a women's start. Um, that's not a skeleton term, term because... 
In skeleton, the men and the women start at the same place. But in luge, the women start a little lower down the track. It's for history, you know, I don't know. Probably kind of like tennis, the men play five sets, the women play three. I don't know why it is. It's just that way. Anyway, um, and then in, and then that spring, I guess I guess February, really, we went to the other track in the United States, which is in, you know where that is, Brad? Lake Placid, New York would yes. be my guess. Yes. Right on. Yes, Lake Placid, New York. Um, another awesome site just with oozes, uh, oozing, oozing history, I should say. Um, and we went there and uh, we did another skeleton school. So we did Lake Placid Skeleton U. Um, little different setup, but the same idea. Um, but also we had new people in the class, so we didn't make it up to the top either. We got to the second highest start and did it again. Um, and, and that was our first season. That was the first season. And we did that together, my brother and I. And then the next year, um, we just did kind of some recreational, like, hey, we're up skiing in Whistler. Let's see if we can rent sleds and go on the Whistler track. And is that a possibility for the public? Um, so Whistler has a tourist run, uh, that the public can sign up for in our case, because we had completed driving school and we had sort of this, this license, if you will, um, it, it kind of gave us permission to get on some tracks, um, and, and, and buy some time on the track. And I say buy some time. I mean, they charge you per run. I don't know if it's $50 a run, $25 a run, um, and so we did that. And we didn't go off the top of Whistler because that would have been crazy. Um, but we did that. And we went back to Park City. We did some more runs there. So that was kind of the first, the first two seasons of it. Um, I, 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 concurrent with all this going on, I was doing an MBA degree. Uh, and so in December of 2014, I finished school. And in January of 2015... I moved to Park City for the rest of the winter so that I could just train full time at the skeleton and kind of see where it went. So how does that work? I mean, is this a facility run by an Olympic uh, entity or is it a private facility where you just negotiate and and get time on the hill? Do you have a coach? Um, Yeah, good questions all. So so it, it varies by track, but typically what happens is um, if you're sort of cleared to go off to, to, to train at a track, there are different types of sessions. There are international sessions where you have athletes from the different countries who are licensed athletes competing on the world tour, um, and they can train at that certain time. Park City has this, um, this local program that is mostly in the evenings, and in limited numbers, you can show up and get your two or three runs a night on the nights that they're having it. And so that's what I was doing. And this same coach Lincoln, who had been at our driving school, was also the guy who was overseeing that program. Uh, and so, you know, essentially we'd take a run. And at one point on the track, he'd be videoing us or watching us. And then we get to the top and he'd say, all right, this is where you're screwing up. Or this is where you're doing really well. And so you actually get a little little bit of coaching. It's kind of informal at that, at that level. Um, but those are the developmental steps that you take, you know, you start a new sport and, and, you know, it'd be pretty unusual that your, your first time playing soccer in seventh grade, that your parents would hire a full-time coach for you, right? You, you just, you kind of play around at first. And so, um, that was kind of, kind of how it was going. And, and at that time I had entered into some discussions with, in a roundabout way, I'd gotten in touch with the head of the Israeli skeleton and bobsled program, David Graves. I had no idea the program existed. It was random chance that, that I came upon this information. And, uh, and he and I started talking and, and I said, well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of doing this anyway. And I, I want to compete. Um, and I had qualified in the U.S. program um, through one of their um, one of their test sessions that they do. It's called a combine session, and I had hit a set of standards that allowed me to train in Park City at a very reduced rate. This guy, I think it was called Elite Developmental Program, something like that. So they weren't paying me, but I was not paying a lot to do this. Um, and based on that information, and based on that, I was getting ready to compete. Um, the head of the Israeli Federation had had interest in me competing as an athlete. And I was really interested in doing that. And 
representing Israel where I have, I have a lot of family and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Jewish and I'm a Jewish athlete. And so, uh, so that's, that's kind of one of the, uh, one of the Bora, dreams to Bora represent. Say, a Jewish <laughs> athlete, is there a Jewish athlete? They not know this. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and I think of airplane, right? Right. Hey, do you have any light reading? Oh, famous Jewish athletes oh, in a little yeah, two page pamphlet, right? right? <laughs> oh my goodness. So, um, you know, and, and, and we can joke about it and I, you know, I think it's hilarious. Um, but at the same time, uh, there, there is this program. Israel has this program. Historically, it usually was either one bobsled team or one skeleton athlete. Um, but it happened that right at the time that I came on board the Israeli program, another athlete came on board at the same time. And the next year, um, another athlete came out of retirement. So we actually had four of us all of a sudden competing for Israel and trying to make the 2018 Olympics in, in South Korea. So it just sort of, things grew kind of organically. Um, and next thing I knew, I was part of this, this four man team, uh, trying, trying to make it happen. That's cool. You're training, you have a chance to train together and kind of support each other. Or are you battling for one or two spots and getting competitive? <laughs> I mean, how did that work? Yeah. So, so it, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and, 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 you know, Brad, like what I'd like to say is, because I was a phys ed teacher for 15 years, yeah, soccer so coach, track coach. You, you had that background in track. You were a sprinter in, in high school. And yeah, hurdler. Had some, uh, a hurdler. Mm-hmm. You, you did some high jumping. You had that athleticism, which in skeleton, mm-hmm. it seems like the essence of it is that explosive start, mm-hmm. right? And then getting competency on the sled so that you can... Are you making subtle turns with your body movements as you navigate the track? Yeah, yeah. Subtle and sometimes not so subtle movements to get you around the turns. So it's kind of like wake surfing out there in the boat this morning (laughs) where if you just put the tiniest bit of pressure on your arch... That's it's uh it's the you know it's the success or failure right there mm-hmm. it's incredibly nuanced, uh, but having that initial burst of speed is what's going to get you into the game. Otherwise, I would imagine you're just not gonna you're not gonna be competitive. Right, right. So um and, and being competitive, you know, we can, we can measure that in different ways, but probably about half of the race is that first 30 meters when you're, you're pushing off, you're sprinting as fast as you can, getting up to speed and diving on the sled. That's probably half of it. And then the other half of it is once you're on the sled, um, making your way down the track in the fastest way possible, getting the best lines, um, not having to drag your toes for big turns, you know, timing your turns just right and all those sorts of things, avoiding hits and, 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 and that sort of thing. And so... So it's kind of a half and half. So there's there's this pure athleticism, this kind of animal first 30 meters. It's the first five seconds of your run. And then it's get on your sled, get in position, get as aerodynamic as you can, be as relaxed as you can, and make your way down the track. I guess similar to bobsled when we saw, this was now many years ago, the U.S. getting smart and attracting uh, athletes from other sports like Herschel Walker, the most famous <laughs> example, where they realized if they had some uh, world class sprinters as as riders, of course not the driver because that guy's an extremely competent uh, driver of the bobsled, but they needed some raw power. And I think even to this day, you're seeing some uh, summer Olympic Olympic level athletes crossing over and joining the U.S. bobsled team. Yeah, you have uh, Lola Jones was just oh in yeah, the last Lola, Olympics. of course she was yeah. she was pushing and. And and so one one big difference between the bobsled and the skeleton, because there are actually a lot of similarities, but one of the big differences is you can really be a specialist in bobsled in the sense that if you are not the driver, you're pushing and and there's certainly a lot of technique to how that push happens, but it's it's a lot of raw power and athleticism. And then you duck your freaking head. You don't even then, you don't do anything. Just shut up and duck your head. head. Yeah. Close your eyes yeah. too so you yeah. don't scream. Do not look up and see what's going on. You don't want to see it and you're just going to slow down the sled. So yeah. So um so it's different where skeleton you ha- you have to have that sort of beast mode to really <laughs> rip into your start um if you're going to be elite and then you have to be able to get on that sled and relax and steer your way down the course and one of the tricks for a skeleton driver is you don't want to look up because it, it kills your aerodynamics when you look up. So what you're trying to do, if you can picture, is you're trying to keep your head in a neutral position in front of you, which means your face is basically pointing down at the ice and just kind of like, like get your eyes looking up 
as much as you can without having to actually lift your chin. Oh, mercy. So that's the idea. And, and we say that, you know, people who do skeleton for a lot of years are going to have those lines on their forehead from the furrowed brow of, of looking up without lifting your head up. Like a surfer with your neck craned for the, the waves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what sport that reminds me of? You're probably going to guess that? this. What's that? The, the combination of beast mode and then being able to relax and execute. <sighs> what is that Speed like? golf, man. Oh, you got to exactly. run hard. You got to be an endurance machine. Exactly. And then you have to go execute this precise shot. Mm-hmm. I didn't know we had that similarity. No, you're this exactly podcast. right. That's absolutely fabulous insight. You're exactly right. It's, it's that ability to push your body to its absolute physical limit and then just completely relax it and focus in the moment. I mean, when right. you dive on the sled, you've got to be tremendously out of breath and full of lactic acid where... Mm-hmm. You know, you're exhausted in a way, and now you have to quickly get into that into that chill mode. That's that's right, fascinating. Right. The yeah. other the other sport, Brad, that uh, that that is similar to that same idea if, in, in an Olympic sport is the biathlon. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And yeah. those those athletes, I mean, they are so finely trained that they're they're buzzing around the course, and then I, I've heard at least that they can actually. Uh, skip a heartbeat sometimes when they are slowing their breathing to focus on the target for their shot. So it's it's kind of that same idea between that, the speed golf, skeleton, they all have that similarity, right? So, Love it. Yeah. So yeah. now you're in the mix with the other Israelis. Right. The Jews are storming the Olympic Games. It's all happening. So um, and how does it work to qualify? What do you have to do? So, so to qualify... Um, at a minimum, you have to you you have to be in the top sixty in the world at the time when they cut off scoring for qualifying. So in a normal year, uh, we race through the end of February, beginning of March. In an Olympic year, you only have till mid mid January because then you need three or four weeks of time for all the athletes who qualify for the Olympics to accept their bids, or technically their company their, their country accepts the bid. Uh, and then you need to get accredited for the Olympics. You need to get your ID. You need to get the travel plans. You need to get all this stuff. So um, so in the Olympic year, it, it happens really fast. We started, I was on the ice training in September this last year. Where'd you find the ice? Uh, we, were in, we were in Calgary to start. Oh, they had ice. Oh, they so they iced the course up. Calgary yeah. opened early this year. Whistler was open the first day of October. Um, in Europe, Lillehammer and Norway. I mean, there were, there were a number of tracks that opened really early this year so that they could, they could get athletes training and then, and then get the races on. So you have to be top 60 in the world. Um, and then the way they have it set up right now is there, there's a quota system. So on the men's side, 30 people can, can be in the Olympics for skeleton. So that's it. That's all you got is 30 spots. Um, the top three nations will be allowed three athletes each. So, and by top three nations, basically, basically they rank that based on your third athlete's world ranking. So if the USA's third athlete is ranked 15th in the world and Canada's is 18th in the world and Israel's is 20th in the world, then that means the U.S. has the top ranked third athlete. So the U.S. would be the first country to qualify and get three athletes. So three countries get three athletes in the Olympics. And I'm trying to think this year, it was not the U.S. They just missed. It was, it was um, Canada. It was Germany, who has a, an awesome sliding program. Um, oh, and the third one escapes me. Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan. It may have been Mother Russia. Oh. May have been Mother Russia. Um, anyhow, whatever. So So three countries. So that's nine spots. And then... Six countries. Oh, the spots are going quickly, man. Yeah. Shoot. Six countries get two spots each. And that's that's the same format. Whoever's got the highest second ranked athlete. So that's 12 more. That's so all 21. of a sudden, 21 Crap. spots are gone. Now, in addition, the host country is guaranteed a spot. So South Korea gets a spot. Right. So we're going to talk about that later. Yeah. What yeah. that spot, <laughs> how many times that spot gets to practice versus mm-hmm. the other athletes. Okay. <laughs> carry on, carry on. So you have that. And then, um, it's, it's almost like, you know, the sport a little, Brad, it's almost like you've, uh, you've heard of we this. We were rooting for you. Yeah. So, um, and then in addition, they have what's, what's called a, um, a continental spot. And so essentially every continent that has a viable athlete who meets that top 60 in the world standard 
gets to have at least one representative at the Olympics. Right. So this is no longer, I imagine it's been modified since the days of the Jamaican bobsled team. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, we're going to mm-hmm. try this. And that was so cute. And Eddie the Eagle, remember the ski jumper right. that was hapless, but he captured the hearts of all the Olympic fans for uh, ski jumping 47 feet when the other guys are going 200. And so now they have this baseline qualification, obviously, in track and field, too, where you have to meet this basic standard so we don't have the, the lady coming in at four hours in the marathon from, <laughs> from a random country, which is, you know, right. it's kind of an interesting it's part admirable. of the Olympics. Yeah, it was cool, but now it's it's you know it's more legitimized where every guy out there is has has done some hard work to qualify regardless of what country. Yeah, yeah. So in in this particular case, two thousand eighteen, um, you have well, so so interestingly, they count the Americas as one continent. Uh, so for instance, I have a friend from uh, Colombia, and he he was not able to qualify because he he would have had to beat all the Canadian and American athletes. So he would he would not have gotten it. There's no like South American qualifier or Central American, um, but this year uh, for the first time ever, Africa had an athlete who made it in the top sixty, and so he uh, uh, was competing for Ghana, and therefore he received one of those continental spots. So based on world rankings, he he would not have been invited, but based on the continental spot, he earned that spot, and so and so you had the 21 athletes from the quotas. Then you had the South Korean was 22. And then you had an athlete from Ghana. So that's 23. So that basically left all the rest of the countries in the world, seven spots to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, And so that's where Israel fell. We, We weren't, we didn't have people ranked high enough where we could qualify two or three athletes. And, um, that put us in the mix for one of those seven spots. So, in terms of my personal uh, season and qualifications and training, that's what I was gunning for. And it was pretty evident before the season started that that's where we would fall, that it was really unlikely that we could crack into those top nine countries. Just, just uh, you know, didn't have the resources, didn't have the experience, didn't have, didn't have the, right, the right athlete in the sense that, as you pointed out earlier, if you have one of these incredible track athletes, right, if you have someone who can, who can throw down a 10, 5, 100 meter dash on the track, that might transfer pretty well to a, a hot start in the skeleton. Um, we don't have anyone who's 11, uh, who's 10-5. I don't think we have anyone who's an 11-5. I think we're more around 12-second guys in terms of the raw sprint. Um, the driving was the piece where we were improving a lot, and we had guys who were, who were doing well. And so if you look at the, the score sheets, at the timesheets for races, you'd see where one of, one of our guys, whether it was me or one of my teammates, um, you, you might see a start 28th in the race. And then on the next time check, we're in 26th place and 25th. And then by the end of the race, maybe we're in 17th place. Well, so they, have nice, uh, they have a start check, like a 30-meter 30 yeah. 30 yeah. start check. So you can see how yeah. much you're giving up to number one in the world yep. versus the rest of the, the driving. Yeah. That's cool. All yeah. the way down the track, you can see, you can see your splits uh, at different places down the track. Yeah. So it really lets you, you know, like in training, it gives you an idea of, hey, where, where am I really losing time here? You know, or where am I looking really good with my lines? So it's, it's helpful that way. So um so we were in the fight for seven spots, and, and, and that's where this season started, Spot, fight for seven spots, okay? Um, there's, there's another piece of this within my team, and, and, and you said, like, well, how does it work with the team? Are you guys all teammates? You're all helping each other out, or are you competing against each other? Or, uh, and it's a combination of that. And, and because I was a, a teacher for a long time and a, and a coach of teams and all this, what I'd like to say is, you know what? The four of us did everything we could possibly do to help one another to get the best times, et cetera, et cetera. The, the reality is um, that, that, that that's not always the case because we're, we're competing against everyone else in the world, but we're also competing against each other. Yeah. And if I could beat all the other guys in the world, but my teammate beats me, he gets a spot and I get to watch, right? And the goal for all of us, clearly at the start of the season, the goal for, the, for, for all of us who are doing this is, we want to make the Olympics. Right. So that's the dynamic is you're, you're trying to balance on the one hand, this is my teaming. This is someone who I want to see succeed. And on the other hand, um, you, you want to succeed even more. Yeah, right? that, that's a really cool concept to talk about and how 
that it's possible to do this in a healthy manner. And I think people screwed this up so much. I remember when I was thrust into the Division I uh, NCAA uh, collegiate running experience at UC Santa Barbara, and we had 21 guys out for the cross-country team. And, and like the first day, the coach said, welcome, everyone. Looks like we have a nice turnout. Seven of you are going to be able to uh, make the traveling squad and get the cool sweatsuit and uh, be seen as, you know, the actual guys that are scoring points for the team. And the rest of you are going to, you can work out with us if you want and you know run these <laughs> oh, random thanks. home meets and so it, it fostered a in many ways an unhealthy competitive environment especially like when a kid would skip a workout because he had a class and then he'd show up the next day and push the pace too hard for the people that worked really hard the previous day because he wanted to show his medal if the coach was watching or whatever was going through the mind of these young athletes but then we have other examples where the, the warriors at practice where they're having the three point shooting contest after <laughs> and Clay Thompson and Steph Curry are probably the two greatest shooters in the history of the NBA. Does it, is it a coincidence that they've been playing together for seven years? Of course not. They push each other to the greatest heights of excellence and sometimes it can get intense. But I think in, in, in your sport, it, it wasn't a boxing match, right? You're not going to fight the, the two last standing Israelis. So <laughs> in many ways, you set yourself up for an intense competitive environment, which is the only freaking way you're going to get the very best out of, out of your body is to see the, that guy put up the times that you've been training with and going, ah, you know, or like, you know, Ray starting this whole journey with that first uh, trip down the, down the course. And I would celebrate that, except for in general, don't try to follow Ray in doing anything. <laughs> and you can go on YouTube. I forget what the name of the YouTube video is. Uh, Big George wiping out on the high chair where he had this contraption, this airfoil oh, thing. Yeah, the air and chair. he took the biggest wipeout of all time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll watch him doing a lot of stuff. And then once in a while, we'll follow him down the track. So back to the Israelis in the mix there for those final precious spots. Yeah, so, so and, you, and you bring up a very good point, which um, none of us had really been through the four full years, the, the full four-year cycle where you're training, you're training each year, you're a year closer to Olympics, and then finally the Olympic year is there, and you still have to go through your entire season just to qualify to make Olympics. And so I had sort of, sort of been told, so, some of the other athletes from other countries who had been through it before had intimated, like, you know, the Olympic season isn't all it's cracked up to be. You know, people can be assholes. Um, oh. you, you, it's kind of more stressful. People tend to be less helpful in an Olympic year than they might be in another year. Uh, all those sorts of things. And, um, and and so in some ways, the Olympic year truly was was not my favorite year to be out there in some ways. Because there were times where I, where I felt that. I felt that either that pressure that judgment. Um, I felt someone else who I had called friends not be there when I needed them to be there. Um, and, and I felt that, that paradox for myself of um, how much do I give to, to the people around me? How much do I keep to myself? And, um, and at the same time, that's a two-way street. So am, am I giving to someone all that I can and receiving less than they have to offer, and and is that a relationship that I want or don't want? And there are so there are all these crazy dynamics going on out there, and you know I've got to think this is this is not unique to skeleton. This is what happens on on all kinds of teams, you know. And you you read, you know, it's 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 football off season, and and they're they're back in training camps, and and you hear about these uh, you know veteran quarterbacks, um, Tom Brady, who who kind of didn't always want to help Jimmy Garoppolo as much as he could have, you know, or at least that's what's in the news. That's what's in the news. And what's going on behind the scenes could be totally different. I mean, um, maybe he was helping him for all he's worth, but you hear these things. And, and as a fan, you say, well, that sucks because I want my team to be as good as it can be. But Tom Brady has, has a job and he has a contract and he wants to be the one out there starting and throwing the football. And how much can he help someone else take his job? Right. And so these are the same kind of dynamics that, that, you have in skeleton and in, in other elite sports like that. What about the workplace? Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. And I mean, this is, uh, and uh, I love to hear like these evolved voices of today, uh, guys like Seth Godin, who has that incredible um, 
daily blog with a short message. You can sign up for his email, and he's, he's always thinking in this this grand picture. I often reference the the Google guys, um, uh, Ray's buddies, Larry and Sergey, who you know they were they were dead set focused on building the world's greatest search engine. Uh, for years and years, and they turned down those dot com riches that they could have become billionaires four years prior to the event that that, that made them, uh, you know, hit this right. windfall. But it's because they didn't want to compromise their mission. So they were all about something that's different than this short term success and this material, uh, uh, you know, pursuits that we're we're going for. And I think the same for someone who plunges into a competitive environment and just gives everything they got to help everyone around them. And could that person succeed or just like you have those moral checkpoints where it's like, crap, you know, I, I, I timed this guy five times today and, and you know, um, we reviewed his video, but he never bothered once to say, hey, want me to film you the next time? You know, those kind of relationships right. where it's like, exactly. how long do I want to contribute to this unbalanced relationship? And I'm mostly referencing the workplace in case uh, we're, we're trying to have these insights pull out to all areas of life, which I think is one of the beauties of sports and what you went through. Um, but man, that's a that's a tricky slope, man. And I love you mm-hmm. bringing up Tom Brady. I like to pick on him a lot on the show <laughs> for deflating footballs because uh-huh. I don't think he's had nearly as much criticism as he deserves for that disgraceful act. That's one of the worst examples of cheating because it was so stupid and petty and unnecessary. Uh, but yeah, what do you do? I mean, and you got to, I think when you're trying to get to that highest level, uh, the Olympic competition, You got to be so self-focused and self-absorbed. And I remember on the triathlon circuit where these struggling young up and coming pros would say, hey, dude, you got a room at the host hotel? Do you mind if I crash on your floor? I won't be in your way. I won't bother you. And I'd be like, you know, I remember when I was that guy when I was just starting out and not making any prize money. And now they're giving me, you know, rooms and flights and appearance fee. And uh, boy, I could, this would be a great chance to give back to the sport. And then I let some mofo in there and then his girlfriend surprises him and she shows up (laughs) and they're snoring in the middle of the night. And I'm thinking never again, because I would rather buy the guy a room instead of having him mooch my room. And I got to stay focused on my mission, you know? So a constant, it's a constant battle in your mind about how to navigate. I appreciate you bringing that up because it's not just about putting up a faster time, but you're navigating pressures and, and social interactions and a lot of times politics and all that nonsense. Right, right. Oh, exactly. And it, and it's exactly the same thing that happens. You know, we see sport is, is a microcosm of the real world. And so you, you take these things that you're experiencing in sport and people are experiencing the same things uh, in, in their own lives. Um, and, and even even to another level in a sport like skeleton, because one thing that there is in skeleton that hopefully there's not in your workplace is that there's um there's a certain amount of of physical risk and danger in the sport. Oh, forgot about okay, that. Okay, so so this is this is a sport where hey Larry, you're doing great. Yeah. Speed up faster on that last turn and you'll <laughs> beat your time. Really? Okay, I'll try it. Whoa, no right, good. Right. Yeah. So so you know if I say like hey um how do you steer turn six, right? And someone wants to screw around with me and they say, well, it's going to feel like you want to steer down here, but you really need to take the higher line. So steer up at that point, right? And then, and the next thing you know, my sled and I are in the roof, uh, you know, with the wood chips in my shoulder. So, um, so there's a whole other element too, because, because it's, it's like, all right, if you're screwing with someone, you're not just, you're not just helping them get a bad time right? Or, or a lesser place, like you, you're potentially putting someone's life in jeopardy in this sport if, if, if you do that. And so there's a whole other moral, moral like, like, you know, level here of, of what is unacceptable, no matter what my rationale is, right? Oh, and I'm, so you, yeah. you, you would hope that you'd hope that there's no one out there who is, is, is that big of a jerk that, that he or she is going to say, um, like, you know, they're going to tell you to do the wrong thing. Basically you're, you're hoping there's no one who would do that. Um, but there are certainly people who will just, just say like, I'm, I'm not here to help you. This is your problem, you know, deal with it. So, um, so navigating all that stuff. And, and so, you know, within my own team, um, here's this interesting dynamic because there's, there's four of us and, and we're all competing for the same thing, but at the same time, we're all competing for Israel. And so, as soon as you have that that um, name associated with you, you know the track is clear for Israel, uh, Larry Sydney Israel, 
and and you hear that and and you're part of that um as soon as you are competing for something that's bigger than you which which i think i think that's one of the most glorious parts of the olympics is competing for something bigger than yourself um but the israel is a very very <laughs> small country not bigger than you <laughs> so so you know that's that's a whole other thing is is the the public perception that's out there and you have this sport and you're a part of this sport the sport is bigger than me the country is bigger than me the olympic ideals the, the olympic, olympic ideals the olympic motto every, every, there's yeah. there's there's all of that layered on top of things and so and so um there there's also this whole element of okay what what goes on behind closed doors between me and another athlete and what goes on in 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 public that's a whole other piece of it right and and think about like cycling tour de france that kind of stuff if we only knew what was going on behind closed doors i can i can only imagine a lot of needles you know, i guess a lot of needles a lot of checking each other's butts out um usually with the needles um but you know there there's that kind of stuff too um my team was a team where where largely we we were able to get along and we were able to support one another um you know to, at different levels i mean was i a better friend with one person on my team than I was with another person on my team. Sure, sure. I, I think that's I think that's natural, um, but not to the point where I had any interest in in hurting someone's performance. My my feeling has always been, um, especially especially being a, a former track and field athlete. My idea is, if my goal is to run a, a, a four fifty mile, let's say that's not an elite time. Let's let's make it a a four minute mile. I want to run a four minute mile. If I go out and run a 358 and Brad here runs a 350 and kicks my butt, I am not upset with how that race went down. Okay. Uh, I had my goals. I had my standards. I put out as much as I could. And I had a huge success there in that, in that instance. And if you can be better than me on that day, more power to you. Right. And so, so that was my approach towards my teammates was, um, I want to prepare for this season like I've never prepared before. I hired a full-time, I say full-time, I mean, it was kind of over distance. I hired a, a, a Canadian who had just retired from skeleton and was, was coaching. And I hired him as my personal coach for the entire off season and the start of the season so that um, I could have every advantage possible. Um, I, I put myself through just, just more intense workouts than, than I had done in years. And I started the season at age 45. Okay, where a lot of the athletes are in their 20s and some in their 30s. Um, and, and, you know, your, your body is not the same at age 45 as it is at age 25. It's pure fact. It doesn't mean you can't accomplish some of the same things, but your body's not the same. But uh, your physique is very strong. Uh, you have a young woman wife. You are very, uh, very ready for perform everything. Yeah, I mean, it was, this, is a, yeah. this is the amazing part is like, you just jumped into this a lifelong commitment to fitness and all that. Absolutely. But this is like, uh, it's almost, you know, over your head at a certain aspect and you're just fighting it out. I right. mean, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned your age at some point, I guess I should have asked you for the listener, but you know, that, that's a, a phenomenal uh, uh, accomplishment to mix in the game. I don't care what place you got, but you're like, you're on the starting line with a bunch of dudes that are going for their Olympic dream, which has consumed their life and they're 23 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, there, there, there's certainly, there's the age piece to it. And, um, and from that perspective, so, so age to me is, is not an excuse. It's not a reason to fail. Um, but I hope it's, I hope it's a reason to, to motivate people. I hope it's a reason for, for other people to look and say, Hey, the fact that I'm in my forties or my fifties or my sixties, or for some people in their thirties and they're feeling old or whatever, the fact is you can still go out there and, and there's a lot you can achieve. You know, and here I'm, I'm sitting across the table talking to, to Brad, who has the world record in speed golf that he got this summer. And not, he, not the old guy record. Not the old the guy. The world record. Every, the, the anyone any age record, right? And, um, and Brad is, is also not in his 20s or 30s, right? Or 40s. Or 40s. Um, amazing. So, so, you know, we're sitting here and the two of us are sitting across the table talking to one another. And, and I hope that both of us, can provide some inspiration to our listeners and to people who may hear the story years from now, who knows, 
or someone who who happened to have been doing a little reading on the Israeli skeleton team or on the sport in general who can say, you know what, man, Larry Larry did not make the Olympics, which was the ultimate goal. And, oh, I guess you know, we can stop and it listening was, to the show now. It was, oh. uh, and, and, and it was an interesting story how that happened, um, how close I got and why I did not get invited. Um, but you can take the positive out of it and say, that's freaking ridiculous that a guy's 45 years old and he was that close. I also think you just, that, that, that could be the quote of the show right there. And, and the, the, the best way to twist that age issue in a positive direction is that your age is serving as an inspiration. So it's like, that's driving you mm -hmm. to be the best you can be. It's not a handicap because I think some people in the back of their minds, whatever they're doing is like, oh shit, I'm kind of old for this, this adult league. I, I better bump down to the, the C division or the D. Mm -hmm. um, but you could totally take that and spin it the other way and saying, I stand here on the starting line with these young fools and my power and my, you know, my, my driving forces that I'm going to be an inspiration. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and I want to go back to something you said too, a couple minutes ago. Um, and you, you mentioned this, this idea of, of, um, lifelong fitness, of keeping your body in shape throughout your lifetime. And this is something that I do. This is something that you clearly do. My brother does. My wife does. There, there are so many of us who do that. And it takes me back to one of my favorite quotes. And I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan. So you'll excuse me if, uh, if that rubs some of you the wrong way. Many people from Connecticut are Dallas <laughs> Cowboys fans. Clearly. Texas and Connecticut are very similar cultures. So um, a lifelong Dallas Cowboys fan and Tex Schramm from back in the day with the Cowboys management. And he said, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Okay. And it, think about that. Let, let that sink in. You know, we talk about luck. What is luck? Preparation meets opportunity. Okay. If I had not kept myself in shape all my life, None of the stuff we're talking about would have ever happened. None of it would have ever happened. Okay. If Brad did not keep himself in great shape, the speed golf thing would, would be, he'd be watching a video of the guy who set the record, which would not have been his video. Okay. And there, there are applicabilities in other areas, um, in, in, in work. My brother was a, a very early Google employee. If he had not been, so prepared and so good at what he did when that opportunity came. Well, most importantly, going to Harvard and MIT and just pursuing the highest level of academic performance. And gee, it wasn't he lucky to pick that company instead of Alta Vista search engine. <laughs> I, had, we'll have him on the podcast and talk about this, but I think that's a great example. Is like, you know, we have the, um, the, the people looking at people who are successful and then offering a quip uh, in, in, you know, in, in the same breath as saying, oh yeah, that guy was, you know, he, um, he, he, he raced around and did the skeleton. Oh, must be nice to have that much free time or whatever quip you want to offer mm -hmm. up or about your brother. And, oh, he's wealthy. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Must be nice. He was, he chose Google and, uh, blah, blah, blah. Instead of kind of taking ownership and saying, oh, preparation and opportunity. Have I created opportunities for myself or do I slam the door on them because I have self-limiting beliefs? Mm -hmm. And then speaking of the preparation, like, are you, are you doing all that you can do? And whew, that's, that's some heavy stuff for people that are sitting in a place where they, they wish they were further up the road. And I remember as an athlete wishing that I could beat the number one guy, uh, Mike Pig, Mark Allen, these guys. And then I remember taking off and uh, training with Pig at his home base and realizing that this guy was committed at a different level than I was. I, I was able to verbalize that I was really committed and I want to be the number mm -hmm. one guy and I'm so focused and everyone's like, oh, good, you go, you go, <laughs> boy, you're doing great. Isn't that mm -hmm. wonderful how hard you train? Yeah. But when you expose yourself to someone who's who's doing, you know, what you wish you could, whew, then, you, then you can look in the mirror and go, well, am I, am I okay, you know, being how I am or do I want to just you know, go for it, which is, that's why, you're, that's why we got you on the podcast to talk about this mm -hmm. dude who was teaching, teaching kids to excel in sports. And then, then in the next breath, he's out there. Okay. So we, we, we left off with there's seven spots left. We got to finish that story. <laughs> okay. the, the spots are taken so quickly though. It's so disappointing. Okay. Seven left. Seven left for the Olympics. So 30 athletes, seven left. So, um, so the first thing that happened in our season after, after some training, um, 
we had to have an Israeli team race off. The reason for that is, um, and, and most countries have to do that, unless you only have one or two athletes. Most countries have to do that. And the reason is because there are certain quotas for how many spots a given country gets on a given tour. And there are three different levels of skeleton racing. So at the top, you have the World Cup. And that's something that from time to time is on, on TV. In Europe, it's on TV all the time. It's a big deal. The World Cup are going to be your top one or two or three athletes per country who have qualified at a certain very high level. The next level down is called the Intercontinental Cup. And those races happen around the world. That's just a, a, cup, a touch below World Cup. And then you have, um, simultaneously, you have the North American Cup, where you race on North American tracks in the U.S. and Canada. And you have the European Cup, where you're racing on the European tracks. Those are approximately the same level. So you have three different levels of racing. For Israel, we did not have a, a, a World Cup spot this year. You, we had to have someone in the top 60 last year to get that spot. We missed by a few spots. So we had one spot in the Intercontinental Cup. And then we had four spots in the North America's Cup and two spots in the European Cup. So if you do the math, if you have one spot on this Intercontinental Cup and you have four athletes, someone's not getting a race there because only one person does. So we had to do a race off essentially to determine who gets the first choice of getting into those different levels of races. So um, before we even got to the race off, one of our guys had a, a just a brutal accident Um Suffered a collapsed lung, broken ribs. A skeleton uh, accident. Skeleton accident. Oh, mercy. Skeleton accident. Ki- kind of a, a fluky accident. I mean, this was, he was an experienced guy. And um, Whistler's a really tough, fast track. Uh, and really just a fluke accident. So I, I won't get into the details. He's fine. Um, he's healed up. He's great. If he wanted to get on the skeleton sled next year, he could do that. Uh, I know that's not particularly his plan right now. But um, but the point is, we were down to three athletes. So one one athlete injured, um, in any sport, you know, this stuff can happen. And and unfortunately for him, it did. So the three of us went to the race off. Um, the first race off was in Whistler, fastest track in the world. Uh, I had gone, it was the only track I'd ever gone 80 miles an hour on coming into this season. Um, when we did our race off, I laid down what I felt like was a pretty incredible run. I had, I had one notable really rough turn, but made a great comeback off that turn and um, hit 85 miles an hour on the track, 85 miles an hour. So basically like just shattered my personal record for how fast I'd ever gone. I was a, like two seconds faster than I'd ever gone down the track. It was, it was pretty phenomenal. How are they measuring their speed? So they have, um, just like they have these timing eyes that give you your splits, they have a couple of speed traps set oh, as well. So that's why you see it on TV so, during yeah. the coverage. Yeah. yeah. So they're usually usually two, three, four points down the track where they can give you a speed. Um, so hundred is that faster than? How does that compare to the losing the bobsled operation? So so in terms of top speeds, skeleton it's it's hard to even imagine. Skeleton is the slowest of the three, and they're all pretty close. Um, bobsled uh, usually is is a little faster, and I believe that luge, which I don't know nearly as much about because we don't travel with the luge athletes. I believe they're the fastest. I think somebody has gone over 90 miles an hour on that Whistler track on a luge, but not on a skeleton. Yeah, that's all comparable except for the fact that the other athletes don't have their face (laughs) three inches from the ice. So 85. So 85 miles an hour. Yeah. So I came down with a huge personal record on the track. Is that why your license plate says LS85? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, 85 is, miles an hour. This is during the race off? This is during so the you, national team race off. So this is your, 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 the biggest, most important event of your life. Most you, you important came event. came through this, under peak performance. This is, yeah, this is the first step towards putting myself in position to make Olympics. Um. Something amazing at this at, at this particular time. I had my wife and and we have a one year old, um, our first child, and he was um, he was what was he at the time six months old, and he was traveling with us. We were all traveling together. So I get to the bottom of my run, and not only did I just have this incredible run, but I get up off my sled, and who's standing there right at the edge of the track is is my wife and my son. You know, there to congratulate me, holding an Israeli flag. So. Incredibly special moment um, for so many reasons. And um, my two teammates came down the track. And by the time they were done, I was in third place. 
So these guys laid down. Um, so by virtue of me being in third place, that means on the second run, and it's it's two runs for the race, on the second run down, I go first because we go last to first. So I go first, and I lay down a run that was um, basically identical, like I think two hundredths of a second apart, which is, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, and the other two guys came down ahead of me again. So in the end, I got, I got third place in, in our Israeli race off. Now this was one race out of two because we then went to Lake Placid and spent a week training and did another race off in Lake Placid. Same result, same order of finish for the three of us. Um, but I go back to what I said earlier, which is, which is that in, in that moment, after putting down an incredible summer of training, pushing my body in a way that it, it had not been pushed in 25 years probably since I played college football, ran college track, and I probably had not pushed my body to that limit since that time. Um, came down with phenomenal runs. Oh, and Placid as well. Um, and Placid like as well. Great as well. runs, great yeah. runs. Um, and, so, and so, you know, at that point, all I can do is say, hey, first race of the season, I, I had fantastic races. You guys beat me. Kudos to you. Hats off. And now let's get down to this and see who can who can race. Because now we're going to have to compete against everyone else in the world. So uh, at that point, races are selected. Um, and I'm going to be in North America where I have the best chance to score points, where I know the tracks well. Mm. My other teammate's going to be in North America as well. And then the third guy, the guy who won the race off, is going to go to this inter intercontinental uh, cup where he'll race at a little bit of a higher level opportunity to score more points, but the competition's tougher. So as it happened, the first half of the season, the Intercontinental Cup ran concurrently in North America with our races on the North America's Cup. And then the second half of the season was in Europe. So um, so as it happened, the three of us spent largely the first half of the season all in the same locations. The training times weren't the same because it was two different sets of races. And the race times weren't the same but we were all on the same track at uh, the same the same time period. So, um, so that was an interesting dynamic. Um, hard to compare across races because the ice conditions change throughout the day. And so sometimes in the morning, the ice is a lot faster than it is in the afternoon. Sometimes you can flip that. Um, so, uh, so that was the scene as we went in the season. And, um, and at that point, coming off the Israeli race, we knew our rankings within our country for that moment um, but no points were scored. You don't get points for your national team races. All the points are international. So at that point, blank slate, let's go at it. Um, I'll tell you kind of the, the short story of how the next, the next month and a half went. It was basically a mirror image of how the, the Israeli training and races went. Um, I had my best times on tracks, my best starting times, uh, my highest places I've ever had in races. I got all the way up to if memory serves, I think I got 12th place in a race in Calgary, which was fantastic because in skeleton, if you're not in the top 20 after the first heat, you don't get to do a second heat. And in past races in Calgary, I had not gotten to do a second heat. And this time, not only did I do a second heat, but I was 12th place, which means I had a whole mess of guys who I, who I beat that race. So um, an incredible first half of the season for me, best times. Um, scored a lot of points, but my two teammates continued to, to outperform me. So, um, second half of the season, same thing continued PRs everywhere. Um, by the time, by the time we got to new year's, I had two races left. I had scored more points this year than I had combined in the previous two seasons. Um, so my world ranking was in the 70s. I had finished over 100 the previous two years. I was ranked in the 70s uh, with... And the way they do the system is that I, I would have... Um, I'll get into that in a minute. But let's just say I was in the 70s. Good world ranking, but two teammates ahead of me. Um, at that point, I knew, given the gap, there was no way that that I could be the number one Israeli slider because I only had two races left and it wasn't enough to close that gap, no matter how I did no matter how I did, no matter how they did. So knowing the expense of it, knowing my family, my young son, and wanting to, to get back to Lake Tahoe. And um, we, were, we were living homeless. We were on the road, staying, staying at rentals, didn't have a, a home base. Um, wanted to be able to give that to my family. So I said, listen, I'm going to give up the last few weeks of the season. 
Uh, I'm going to go back home. We're going to find a house. We're going to settle in. Um, and then I'm going to offer to be, to be a, a coach at the Olympics if one of my two teammates indeed makes it. So went down to the wire. My two teammates were neck and neck. Um, I did not race the last two races. Based on how the results shook out, one of my teammates made the Olympics. So he got the, basically he got the 28th spot. Two guys behind him got spots, including the, the gentleman from Ghana who was um, continental representative. And then an athlete, f- funny enough that you'd said, you'd said this country before, my friend Anthony who competes for Jamaica was the 29th athlete to make it. Now at the time I stopped racing, I was ahead of Anthony and I was ahead of a quasi, the, the Ghana athlete. So in essence, I was in the same place internationally in the standings as my teammate who made the Olympics. But because he's from the same country as me, he gets a spot and and I can't qualify for a second spot. So two of us from Israel actually suffered the indignity of essentially qualifying for the Olympics and not getting to go because our teammate was was ahead of us. Um, And it was really close between my two teammates, but obviously only one of them got to go. Uh, and I was a little further back, but again, very happy with my performance because I just blew away all the standards I'd set in the past and had a phenomenal season. Um, so, so I was kind of left holding this, like, you know, people said, Hey, Larry, kind of, what's your takeaway from the season? Are you pissed off? You didn't make the Olympics. Are you upset? Are you happy? How do you feel? Right. I mean, this is like, cause the ultimate measurement is I wanted to make the Olympics. I had a chance to make the Olympics. And I didn't make the Olympics. Um, and my takeaway is that I never did this sport feeling like the only way that I'll be successful is making the Olympics because it is so damn hard to get there. And the athletes you're competing against are, some of these people are started off as very high level sprinters who transitioned to skeleton and then spent the next 12 years of their life doing this, starting at age 18 or 20 or 21. Um, and I'm someone who started this, you know, four years ago at age 40 plus and made the most of it. So, so in the end, God, I, I you know, I kind of like, other than if I'd made the Olympics, I just couldn't be happier with how the season went that I had the season of my life, great time traveling with my wife and my baby, something that I can't imagine we could ever have that kind of experience again, I, how lucky we are to do that. Um, then got to go to the Olympics and serve as an assistant coach for my teammate. Um, and there are certain sort of alliances that get, get put together over the course of the season and at the Olympics so that there are extra eyes on the athletes and extra, extra video footage and stuff. So I was working with a couple of the other athletes too, helping them. Um, but, but obviously it was there with my, my main motivation was, Hey, I want to help my teammate do as well as he could. Uh, we qualified our first ever Olympic athlete in the sliding sports in bobsled luge or skeleton this year, my teammate, AJ. So you know, in so many ways, it was just a raging success. And so I walk away from the experience a feeling like all that I put into the, the sport and all that my family sacrificed for me so I could do this, you know, I get out twice that much. I get out twice that much. And as a CODA, I am now the vice president of the Israeli Bobsled and Skeleton Federation so that I can help the next generation of athletes come up through our system, help identify them, help put them on, on the, the, the track, no pun intended, on the track to, to success, pass on the experience that I have. And, and hopefully the next time that I'm at the Olympics in the winter, I'm going to be there alongside another of our athletes who's qualified, um, whether it's hopefully it's Joel, who already has been through the four years and narrowly missed this time, and hopefully he'll be there, or maybe someone totally new because we now have our first female athlete. We now have a para-athlete who is, is gunning for the Paralympics in 2022. And we now have our first Israeli born athlete on the team. So, so it's like, I, I'm, I'm going through this whole transition now, both back to like civilian life and, and, and working and that sort of thing and being, being a family man and, and also continuing on with skeleton and with the Federation and, and helping the next generation. So the, the whole thing is just, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a dream and, and there's that one little slice of the dream that didn't happen, but the dream happened, you know, and there's so much good that I take out of it. And so, so if someone asks me, you know, hey, good or bad, it's all good. All good. Amazing. 
Wow, that's a really beautiful way to close this. I mean, fantastic perspective. And I guess I should ask, as you head forward into these future challenges, now head you have first. your MBA. Right, head first. <laughs> Dive head first. There you go. <laughs> Dive head first into the rest of your life. But I, I do like that um, we talked a little bit in the middle of the show about this, you know, this whole experience of giving it your all and having that evolved peak performance mindset where, you know, you're out there setting PRs the outside world's going, oh, are you bummed you didn't make the Olympic team? But I think, you know, the, the beauty of your story is that you you absorbed all the all the important life lessons and attributes that are going to serve you uh, in anything else that you you face in the future. Right, right, and and um, and mind you, I'll, I'll I'll start by saying I'm I'm not looking for a big company to hire me right now because I have some other things going on, but I'm the kind of person. Somebody, somebody who has been through that and has taken those lessons and now can take the same lessons you learned in sport, the same lessons you learned about giving 100% to get back 100%, um, those are the things that, that can make someone successful in other areas of their life. And so if you're, if you're um, a business and you're looking for, for amazing employees, you know, some of the people who I was competing with and competing against are exactly those kinds of people. And I see them, I see them transitioning to those roles in companies, or I see them while they're training, also working at some of these companies that support that. Um, and they're just as, just as amazing in the workplace as they are training for the Olympics and training in these sports. And I think that's, that's an amazing lesson for people out there. And if you're a parent and you're, you're wondering, you know, gosh, all this time I put into carting my kid around to the soccer games or the gymnastics, uh, you know, meets on the weekends or, or is, you know, is this going to be worth it if my kid doesn't get a scholarship to college? And, you know, big picture, my, my answer is, oh, my God, of course it is. And, and I'd, I'd have to imagine that, you know, that you have some thoughts on that, too. Oh, my gosh. That's, yeah, you, you said it all. I mean, we're, we're so fixated on the end result. I mean, this is my entire recurring theme for the podcast is to get over yourself and appreciate the journey <laughs> and cultivate that pure motivation whereby you don't attach your self-esteem to the result. And you don't feel like a failure in front of your wife raving, waving the Israeli flag and your kid and you're like, oh, dang, I got third place. It's like you got, <laughs> you know, that was a third place victory because you mm -hmm. just smashed a exactly. PR and went 85 miles an hour. So. If you can take anything away, listeners, these last few minutes, I'm, you know, I, I'm inspired to maintain that focus on, on getting over myself and, and doing things for the right reasons, going for it head first, Larry Sidney, <laughs> going head first down the track, head first into life. Thank you for listening, everyone. Dun, 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 dun. Thank you for listening to the show. We would love your feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And we would also love if you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a hassle. You have to go to desktop iTunes, click on the tab that says ratings and reviews, and then click to rate the show anywhere from five to five stars. And it really helps spread the word so more people can find the show and get over themselves, because they need to. Thanks for doing it. Here's a wild idea. How about eating some good, clean, delicious, sustainably raised meat instead of the nasty, trashy feedlot animals the vast majority of our meat consumption. No wonder there's vegetarians and vegans out there. But look, Wild Idea Buffalo is 100% grass-fed and finished meat. They roam on the open range as they have been for 130,000 years. This wonderful company is doing the best they can to give these animals a good life, harvest them in a humane manner. Check this out. 40 million cattle are slaughtered every year and pushed into the mainstream food supply. You've read books like Fast Food Nation with the disastrous health impact and consequences of this mess. And then, by contrast, 60,000 buffalo a year are harvested. Much more nutritional value, much better feeling deep inside when you order quality meat. Go to wildidea.com, order direct, they'll ship it to your house. It's delicious. You'll be a convert right away. There's nothing in the world like buffalo burger. Fantastic.